Hello and welcome. Good evening. It's nice to see so many of you here. My name is Fabio Gigi. I'm the chair of the Japan Research Center here at SOAS, and I'll be chairing the talk tonight. Our speaker today is Michia Kato, professor of economic history at Osaka Sangyo University. He obtained a BA and later an MA in economics from Keio University in Japan, and his PhD thesis in economic history from the University of Birmingham bore the title Unemployment and Public Policy in Interwar Japan. His main research focus is on the Japanese colonial bureaucrats' perception of the British Empire, and he has published widely and comparatively on colonial governance with articles and book chapters about Japanese colonial mid-level bureaucrats' perceptions of Ireland and India and the knowledge exchange that underpinned colonial projects. He is currently a visiting scholar at the Japan Research Center here at SOAS and indeed a regular participant at the JSC seminars. So we'll follow a traditional academic format. We'll have to talk about one hour first. You will then have ample opportunity to ask questions. I also welcome uh, the people who join us online. You can already start to feed your questions into the Q and A function as the talk uh, goes on. So the talk tonight bears the title, Japanese colonial bureaucrats perception of colonial rule. What did they learn from the British empire? We will, after the talk, retire to the senior common room here in a new attempt uh, to wine and dine you and bring in um, some cheer and merriment after the talk. So please stay here afterwards and we'll assign you somebody who can take you up through the new and improved security measures that uh, make movement in the building somewhat difficult. Now, please join me in welcoming Professor Kato to the JRC. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for introducing me. Uh, I should be nervous, but uh, uh, first I, I, I thank JRC uh, and especially uh, Fabio Gigi Sensei uh, uh, for your kindness to give me the opportunity, precious opportunity uh, to the presentation in front of all of you. And uh, I do my best, <laughs> thank you. And uh, my presentation uh, is about uh, 50 to 60 minutes. So uh, please be patient for a while. And uh, look at the uh, PowerPoint. And uh, then uh, let me uh, start my presentation. Uh, first introduction, uh, this presentation analyzes the career and activities of colonial bureaucrats who worked in pre-war Japanese colonies and spheres of influence uh, to clarify their perceptions of colonial rule and use this as a clue to unravel Japan's colonial governance thought. As a result of Japan's victory in the Sino-Japanese War that broke out in 1894, Japan took possession of Taiwan and became an imperialist country with the colony. Um, Japan was incorporated into international strategy through the Anglo-Japanese Alliance concluded in 1902, won the Rus Russo-Japanese War that broke out in 1904 and inherited the interest of the quantum leased territories that Russia had leased from the Qing dynasty and expanded its influence to northern northeastern China. In 1910, Japan annexed Korea and further expanded its control. In World War I, uh, which broke out in 1914, uh, Japan uh, participated in the war based on the uh, Anglo-Japanese alliance and became the victorious country and increased its international influence. In these colonies and spheres of influence, the government general of Taiwan was established in Taiwan. The government general of Korea was established in Korea and the government general of quantum leased territories it was established in quantum list territories to carry out the governance. 
and the uh, colonial bureaucrats oversaw it. Um, in recent years, there has been an increase in research from a variety of perspectives, including the careers and activities of colonial bureaucrats and the roles they played because they most realistically embodied the reality of the Japanese empire's colonial rule. Uh, in this paper, I will discuss three such colonial uh, bu bureaucrats, including Ushinosuke Ochi, uh, 1865 to 1934, who worked in the government general of Taiwan and the uh, government general of Kwantung Least territories, and Gentaro Yoshimura, 1875 to 1945, who was appointed to the colonial bureau after working in the government general of Kwantung Least Territories, and Urazo Tokinaga, 1884 to 1929, who served in the government general of Korea. Uh, this is the uh, Japanese uh, empire, a bit very local, but uh, uh, at that time very powerful. And this is the British Empire, uh, the, uh, the worldwide empire, uh, as you see. And uh, these are the colonial bureaucrats I <clears throat> talk about uh, today. The Ushinosuke Ochi there, uh, this is the most left one. The center one is uh, Gentaro Yoshimura and uh, Urazo Tokinaga, the most right one. And these colonial bureaucrats were not only people with concrete authority in the colonial areas, but also intellectuals who applied the governance techniques and ideas they had required, acquired from their experiences living overseas in colonial governance. Uh, by examining their careers, activities, and writings, we will clarify the colonial bureaucrats' perceptions of colonial rule and the reality of the Japanese Empire's colonial governance during the area in which they lived. Uh, first, uh, I'll uh, talk about Ushinosuke Ochi, uh, perceptions of governance of colonies and spheres of influence as seen in the career and activities of Ushinosuke Ochi. Ushinosuke Ochi was born on April 28, 1865, and in Fukushima Prefecture. Uh, in September 1888, he graduated from the German Studies Society School. In November of the same year, he passed the first higher civil servant examination. Uh, he took first place after serving as a judge at the Ministry of Justice and an audit at the Board of Audit, he became a counselor uh, in the Legislative Bureau in March 1899. On September 7, 1901, he was ordered to go on a business trip to Taiwan at the request of Shinpei Goto, Secretary of Civil Affairs in the Government General of Taiwan. This business trip was a turning point for him, and in February 1902, he was appointed to the colony of Taiwan as counselor in the government general of Taiwan. In April of the same year, he was ordered to work as a counselor, but in April 1906, he took a leave. Oh, sorry. Um, in April of the same year, uh, 1902, uh, he was ordered to accompany Shinpei Goto on, uh, on his tour of Europe and America and stayed in Germany until September 1903. After returning from Germany, he continued to work as a counselor, but in April 1906, he took a leave of absence due to illness. However, in February 1908, he was reinstated as a counselor in the Governor General of Quantum List of Territories, working in the new sphere of influence of the Japanese Empire. He progressed, his, 
he progressed smoothly through the ranks. And in May 1909, he became Director General for Foreign Affairs of the Government General of Quantum Least Territories, a position that is second only to the Secretary of Civil Affairs. In May 1911, he was relieved of his post as Director General of Foreign Affairs. And in August 1913, he was appointed as Director of the Civil Affairs Bureau of Tarian of the Government General of Quantum List Territories. After that, he remained in Tarian for a long time as the head of the civil administration. But in December 1918, due to illness, he retired. In the autumn of 1932, he toured Manchukuo and continued to show an interest in the spheres of influence of the Japanese Empire. Uh, during his stay, he became ill, returned to Japan, and passed away on May 24, 1934, at the age of 69. Uh, what is uh, noteworthy? about Ouchi's important activities is that he conducted field research on German's colonial policy toward Poland and gained a lot of knowledge. In doing so, he received the support of Georg Mihajewicz, who was his mentor from his time at the German Studies School in Tokyo, and who was also a German bureaucrat at the time and later became prime minister of Germany. Michaelis praised Ouchi's excellence as he studied diligently at German government offices in Breslau, Westphalia, and Silesia. During his stay in Germany, Ouchi also formed close friendships with Polish nationalist activists who aspired to independence from Russia. Uh, Ouchi's dispersed activities can be seen. In this way, Ochi acquired knowledge about colonial governance while serving as a counselor in the government general of Taiwan. And even after transferring to the government general of quantum leased territories, he utilized his practical experience to contribute to administrative management. He also contributed to the formation of foreign policy for colonies and spheres of influence including providing advice on the policy making of Shinpei Koto, Tokuzo Komai, who later served as Secretary General of the State Council of Manchukuo, highly praised Ochi's governance concept and recalled that it had a great influence on the way Manchukuo was governed. Then, uh, Let's look specifically at Ochi's understanding of colonial rule. In an article uh, titled Political Situation in Poland, published in the Taiwan Daily News on 19 September 1903, he stated as follows. Uh, then uh, I uh, refer to the red, red part. Uh, German's rule of Poland did not work easily. Given these circumstances, German's rules of Poland cannot be said to have been a success. But if you look at the various policies in detail, there are many things to learn from Germany. Uh, as you see, Ochi is referring to German colonial rule, comparing the colonial governance policies of Germany, Russia, and Australia and comparing with Russia's coercive rule and Austria's laissez-faire policy, he found that Germans' gradual assimilationism was relatively successful, as it realized that rapid assimilation was impossible. Furthermore, the following article published in the Taiwan Daily News during his time as the government general of Canton Least Territories it shows his active stance in trying to enlighten indigenous people. Uh, 
uh, that Japanese em empires rule over Taiwan uh, not only set an example for other ceded and occupied territories, but also led other countries to study its methods, making it a great highlight in Japanese colonial history. And then yeah, he said, in the past, there were many cases in which colonial countries showed no respect for the customs and manners of the native people, and instead tried to directly assimilate them into the civilization of their home country, resulting in irreversible failures. Then he continues, uh, the Japanese empire investigated and respected the old customs of the indigenous people, adopted the policy of not forcing the civilization of the Japanese people on those who had new, newly come under Japanese influence and contributed to the development of the colony. And uh, that, that uh, uh, part I read now. And I think it is important last month. Uh, for colonial policy to open the way for the islanders to be appointed as government officials uh, to enlighten them. So he stressed the importance of the enlightenment of their indigenous people. And he concludes, uh, it is a good policy to appoint excellent people among the local people as local government office, officials and to build close and friendly relationships with local people. Uh, through this, people would be made aware of the liberal principle of the Japanese empire. Also, all the natives would voluntarily become subjects of the Japanese empire. That is a uh, perception. Ouchi considered the governance of Taiwan in which he was involved to be a successful example and argued that it should be extended to other spheres of influence, such as Karafto, Korea, and quantum leased territories. At the same time, he also emphasized the need to promote assimilation policies by considering local customs. His argument that the special circumstances of a local uh, of a colony it should be considered rather than a simple extension of the domestic law also suggests that a certain degree of discretion should be granted to those in charge of colonial administration. He suggested employing indigenous people as local government officials to enlighten them now, these ideas seem to be shared gradually among the colonies and spheres of influence with the transfer of OG from Taiwan to the government general of quantum these two territories. And uh, let me move to the second person, uh, Gentaro Yoshimura. Uh, perceptions of governance of colonies and spheres of influence as seen in the career and activities of G Gentaro Yoshimura. Uh, Gentaro Yoshimura was born in Tokyo Prefecture on November 20th, 1875, about 10 years after uh, Dan Ushinosuke Ochi, the first uh, bureaucrat uh, we just saw. Uh, he graduated from the Tokyo Imperial University on July 10th, uh, 1899, with good grace and placed fourth out of 79 students. Uh, on 16th July uh, of the same year, uh, he joined, oh, sorry, uh, he graduated from the Tokyo Imperial University on July 10th, 1899. Uh, uh, on 16th July of the same year, he joined the Ministry of Home Affairs and was assigned to the Taiwan Division. Uh, Gentaro Yoshimura is a man whose bureaucratic life began in a colonial department. In November of the same year, 
he passed the higher civil service examination with seventh place out of 31 successful candidates. After working in several prefectures uh, in Japan, he was appointed as counselor in the Legislative Bureau in March in 1902. Uh, that section, uh, Ocho also, the first uh, bureaucrat also belonged, belonged, but uh, Yoshimura as well belonged to that uh, section. Uh, it is said that the section is very uh, elite uh, groups uh, of the bureaucratic world. Uh, as counselor in the Legislative Bureau, uh, Yoshimura traveled to uh, Taiwan in April 1905 uh, to British Hong Kong in July of the same year, to Korea and Manchuria in June 1907, and to Vladivostok in Russia in August of the same year. Uh, he was ordered to go on business trips and became familiar uh, with the circumstances of important regions in Japanese colonies and spheres of influence. All of Yoshimura's overseas business trips as a bureaucrat of the Legislative Bureau was at the request of the governing bodies of colonies and spheres of influence. And uh, it is a thought that the purpose was to share legal information between inland and outland. In July 1908, Yoshimura, who had deepened his knowledge of Japan's colonies and spheres of influence as a counselor in the Legislative Bureau, was appointed as counselor in the Government General Quantum Leased Territories in February 1909. Shortly after taking up his post, he was dispatched to European countries, including Britain, the United States, and also Africa for over a year and a half to research on colonial governance. On May 9th, 1910, while on a business trip, he was appointed director of the Darien Civil Affairs Bureau. But Yoshimura would play a more important role in local governance as a colonial bureaucrat. On May 29, 1911, Yoshimura was appointed to Director General for Foreign Affairs of the Government General of Quantum Leased Territories and was to play an even more important role. As Director General for Foreign Affairs, Yoshimura energetically carried out diplomatic negotiations with China and Russia. Yoshimura's life as a colonial bureaucrat seemed to be going smoothly but on October 5th, 1914, he took a leave of absence due to illness. Yoshimura's uh, medical condition did not improve and he retired from the service uh, on November 2nd, 1916. He was 40 years old. After uh, his retirement, uh, Yoshimura was missed for his rich experience in colonial administration and wealth of knowledge. And in July, 1917, uh, he was commissioned by the Colonial Bureau to engage in research on the colonial policies of the Western countries, mainly, mainly the British colonies. He produced many useful reports. Uh, Yoshimura also contributed to magazines such as Review Diplomatique, and for many years conducted colonial research on a contract basis and many various recommendations regarding colonial administration. Yoshimura passed away on 21st August, just after his wife's death on 10th August, 1945. He was at the age of 69. Yoshimura was an extremely talented bureaucrat. In fact, on May 12, 1910, the Mainichi Daily News which reported uh, that he was appointed uh, the head of Darien Civil Affairs Bureau, wrote that he was the brightest student 
among his classmates, had a clear mind and was an extremely well-educated person. Yoshimura left behind numerous reports and essays on the entire British Empire, the largest colonial empire at the time. Then let's examine the contents of his main writings. His first essay was on Asianism, which was published in Asian Review by the Black Dragon Society in July 1917, just before he was appointed as a commissioned officer of the Colonial Bureau. Uh, this article was based on the Asianism that was being widely promoted in Japan at the time and argued that Japan should play a leading role in the international community, emphasizing Sino-Japanese relationship to compete with Western countries. Uh, it is as follows. The first red, red one. Uh, Asianism was proposed to make Western countries reflect. And it aims to enable the people of Asia to achieve legitimate and free development, thereby contributing to world culture. And Japan and China are the same race and use the same script, dōbun doshu, and the nature of our civilization are also the same. That is the, his uh, perception on Asia. In addition, he contributed an article entitled War and British Government Organization uh, to the same uh, uh, magazine. Asian Review. He argued about the Lloyd George's war cabinet in the United Kingdom during World War I. He pointed out that it was anomalous from the viewpoint of the party cabinet system and that the government was run by the very small number of ministers. He concluded that not only Britain itself, but the entire British Empire was at a major turning point. His first report as commissioned by the Colonial Bureau was Problem of Unity of the British Empire, published in July 1918. At the beginning of the, this report, Yoshimura drew attention uh, to the flower script on the statue of the Earl of Beaconsfield in Parliament Square, which he once saw showing that the motto that used to be empire and freedom was now uh, empire and unity. And he, the, 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 uh, he's uh, saying, I was, uh, I was once in London and on the occasion of Earl uh, of Beaconsfield's Jubilee in spring, I saw his statue in front of the parliament decorated with primrose flowers. Normally, there is a flower script that says empire and liberty, but today it says empire and unity, which made me feel the change of the times. And uh, <clears throat> he, he varied the uh, situation of the uh, uh, British Empire. Uh, in so-called dominions, the scope of autonomy is extremely wide and they have come to occupy a status that is almost independent of their home country. And he also continues, uh, I be believe that the reason why the British overseas territories volunteered to fight for their homeland during the war and made great sacrifice was due of course, to their hostility toward German tyranny, but also to their royal love for their homeland. It can be said that, however, uh, it is hard not to believe that an important factor behind this was the belief that the benefits of the free system could not be truly enjoyed without Britain. And he concluded, uh, liberty is never at odds with unity. It was the foundation of liberty, and unity can be fully effective. 
the current tendency of the British Empire to value unity is largely due to the international situation. But this would not happen unless it rules on a colonial policy that embodies the true values of liberty and unity. In the report, Yoshimura discussed the status of the self-governing territories that made up the British Empire, considering them as an ideal type of empire, and the effectiveness of various policies implemented to maintain the unity of self-governing governing territories with a high degree of autonomy. He verified this and at the same time pointed out its limitations due to changes in the times. An interesting point in problem of unity of the British Empire, his report, is that it pointed out that to maintain the unity of the British Empire, it was important to stabilize governance in the directly ruled colonies such as Ireland and India. There is a difference between self-governing colonies such as Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, which were formed by immigrants from Britain and were given a high degree of autonomy, and directly ruled colonies such as Ireland and India, where inter-ethnic governance was a central issue. Yoshimura's report had been researched and focused on inter-ethnic governance policies, and it reflected the inter-ethnic governance problems that the Japanese empire was also facing. His representative report, Irish Problems, was written in August 1918. The Easter Rising that occurred in Dublin during World War I, when self-governing colonies cooperated with Great Britain, caused a great shock internationally. But Yoshimura argued that there was a deep-rooted anti-British sentiment in Ireland in this background. And he said, oh, this is the, uh, the statue of the Field. The historical one and the right one is uh, I took uh, recently. And about uh, iron, he said, um, it is hard not to believe, uh, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, it must be said that the greatest weakness of Irish governance lies in mistrust. That is the, uh, his uh, perceptions from the Irish problems. And, Continues, governance is ultimately based on a relationship of trust between the ruler and the ruled. And unless the ruler believes in the ruled and the ruled does not believe in the ruler, the purpose of governance cannot be achieved. <clears throat> and although, although there are various forms the important point of governance is the fiduciary relationship between the home country and the colony. Britain had no sympathy or understanding for Ireland. And Britain implemented a stopgap policy and did not foster trust between Britain and Ireland. As a result, the difficulties of governing Ireland were never resolved. Uh, that is the main uh, perception on Irish problems. Uh, this report had a huge influence on Urazo Tokinaga, the third uh, bureaucrat uh, report of the same name, which will be discussed later. And the uh, information contained in the report was referenced and shared among colonial bureaucrats later. Uh, Yoshimura also wrote several reports on India a colony under the direct control of the British Empire, which had become significantly more important within the British Empire since World War I. What kind of governance policy should be implemented in India, which was longing for a legislative assembly and responsible government, was an urgent issue for the British Empire. 
Furthermore, Yoshimura compiled a report titled Indian National Movement, which was printed in March 1921, detailing the historical development of the intensified Indian National Movement and attempting to examine the essential nature of the national movement. In March 1921, uh, two important reports were written. Uh, they are on the union of England and Scotland and Irish revolutionists and Bolsheviks. The former tried to provide clues to solve the Irish problem by exploring the, the factors behind the success of Scotland, which is a different ethnic group but was successfully integrated with England in comparison to the confusing Irish problem. The latter also argued that the Irish independence movement had been transformed by the rise of Sinn Féin, making it difficult to resolve the Irish problem. <clears throat> Yoshimura's writing on Ireland and India revealed his perspective on how to stabilize governance in colonial Korea, where ethnic movements were flourishing. For Yoshimura, as a colonial bureaucrat, the radicalization of the national movement and the accompanying destabilization of the local situation were the last things that he wanted to avoid. Furthermore, in September 1921, Yoshimura summarized the historical development and problems of British governance policy regarding Egypt, which was a de facto colony as a protectorate of Britain in Egyptian problems. In this report, Yoshimura argued that the problem with Britain's governance policy toward Egypt was that it was a policy based on paternalism rather than autonomy and that the British attitude that self-government was not possible for non-Europeans was a fundamental error. He criticized that these policies were also seen in the British rule of India, Ireland, and South Africa. In May 1923, Yoshimura published a report entitled On Union of South Africa, in which he argued that the situation in South Africa was very similar to Ireland's within the British Empire. Yoshimura likened the Boers in South Africa to the Sinn Féin in Ireland, but he compared them to South Africa, which was given autonomy six years after the Boer War, and Ireland, which was ruled by Britain for over 700 years and was finally given autonomy in 1922. He concluded that the distance from the home country was a major cause of the difference. In October 1924, he compiled the Irish border problem, which discussed the issue of separation between North and South Ireland and stated that the Irish problem would not be completely resolved unless the above mentioned issue of separation between North and South Ireland was resolved. Gentaro Yoshimura's report and essays were written mainly on the colonies of the British Empire. Among these, he was particularly passionate about the issue of the governance of different ethnic group, groups in Ireland and India. He reiterated the importance of inter-ethnic governance in maintaining the integrity of the British Empire as a whole. whole. Uh, Yoshimura's critical analysis of the British Empire was aimed at finding ways to resolve the problems that Japan faced in governing its colonies and spheres of influence in Taiwan and Korea, as well as in Guantan Lee's territories. In an essay published after the March 1st independence movement, Yoshimura took a stand against the argument 
that Korean representatives should be sent to the Imperial Diet of Japan, saying that it would not be good for either colonial Korea or Japan. And he says, the uh, red, red part, uh, it is clear that sending Korean representatives uh, to the Imperial Diet was not the only means of making Koreans aware of their status as imperial subjects. And what Koreans uh, should strive for today is not something so rigorous as trying to achieve a false egalitarianism between Japan and Korea at all costs. Without considering the differences in national circumstances and civility, I believe that what is important for Koreans today is to receive solid political training in local government, such as towns and villages. Uh, Yoshimura, uh, who opposed the proposal to send Korean representatives to the Imperial Diet, uh, believed that it would be beneficial to receive solid political training as a government official in local administration, uh, taking it into consideration the difference in political situation and civil standards between the country and Japan. At this point about the importance of enlightenment in colonies and spheres of influence is a recognition shared by Ochi Ushinosuke, the first uh, uh, bureaucrat. However, it was an inherently difficult attempt uh, to pursue the legitimacy of a colonial rule by the Japanese empire while taking the position of criticizing the colonial rule by the British Empire. And next, I, I move to the uh, third colonial uh, bureaucrat, Urazo uh, Tokina. Uh, perceptions of governance of colonies and spheres of influence as seen in the career and activities of Urazo Tokinaga. Uh, Urazo Tokinaga was born in April 1884 in Hiroshima Prefecture. He graduated from Tokyo Imperial University in July 1909, passed the higher civil service examination in November on, of the same year, ranking 70s out of 130 successful candidates, and began working in Korea the following year in May 1910. And Tokinaga engaged in administrative work in various regions of Korea, and November 1916 was appointed director of the General Affairs Bureau of the Government General of Korea. The following year, in October 1917, he was appointed chief of the Internal Affairs Department, and in October 1918, he was appointed chief of the security division of the Inspector General of Police, a position in which he was involved as a civilian bureaucrat in maintaining public order in the colony, which was then under the control of the military police. This appointment was based on the strong wishes of Isaburo Yamagata, Inspector General of Political Affairs of Korea, who wanted to strengthen the role of civil servants in maintaining public order, and Tokinaga responded well to this request. In July 1919, he concurrently held the post of chief of the High Police Division of the Inspector General of Police Affairs Department and was given sole responsibility for police work as a civilian officer. On September 25th, 1919, Tokinaga was appointed as counselor in the government general of Korea, and his skills as an executive were expected to continue. In November of the same year, he was ordered to go on a business trip to Europe and the United States to investigate the current state of, of anti-Japanese public opinion in the United States, which had seemed influenced by the international rise of national self-determination advocated by the US President Woodrow Wilson and to grasp the current state of the Korean independence movement in the United, in the United States. 
On the 25th of November, 1919, he left Yokohama by ship for America. Arriving in San Francisco via Hawaii, he visited Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, Washington, then moved to Canada, arrived in London at the end of August, 1920. And after touring Scotland, Ireland, and other European countries, January 1921st, he departed from London on the 25th of April, returning to Japan in March of the same year. Tokinaga routed the United States, toured the United States and submitted the report from Washington, titled Report on the Investigation of the Korean Independence Movement in the United States. It was later compiled and used by the police bureau in Korea as an internal report in September 1921. Upon arriving in England in August 1920, Tokinaga was ordered by the Governor General of Korea, Makoto Saito, to investigate Ireland and visited Belfast, where he conducted a field survey of Ireland, where the movement for independence from Britain was intensifying at the time. Tokinaga compiled the report Irish Problems by referring to that investigations and the report of the same name by Gentaro Yoshimura, the second bureaucrat. Thereafter, Tokinaga was expected to make use of the experience he had gained as a bureaucrat in Korea and the mainland. And in October 1922, he was appointed director of the Home of Affairs Bureau of Oita Prefecture. In September 1925, he was appointed as governor of Miyazaki Prefecture. And in September 1926, he became governor of Saga Prefecture, but took a leave of absence due to Ill illness and passed away on February 7, 1929 without returning to work. He passed away at the age of 44. Looking at Tokinaga's career, it appears that he was primarily engaged in establishing police administrative system in the colony and related work. In colonial Korea, where he was assigned how to moderately suppress the national independence movement was a critical issue. His time in Korea, coincided with the period of change in Japan's colonial governance policy from a coercive policy to a moderate one. As a civil official, he worked hard to promote the transition from a system led by military force to a civilian police system. The knowledge and experience he had gained through research have shown that the coercive governing attitude would have the opposite effect. Japan's colonial rule faced an important turning point in Korea, and Japan was facing international criticism for its colonial rule. The problem faced by Japan as a newly emerging colonial empire were also the problems faced by Britain, in particular, Ireland, which had a similar geographical location to Korea, experienced an intensification of its independence movement during Tokinaga's tenure. The independence movement in Ireland, which violently shook the British colonial rule, also brought a great sense of crisis to the Japanese colonial rule and the colonial government in general ordered Tokinaga to research Ireland and the United States and strove to establish a governing policy in colonial Korea. Uh, Tokinaga's understanding of colonial rule can be learned from Irish problems and Korea, which is the record of a lecture he gave at the police training school in Seoul. He's here, he says. The century long history of genocide and treachery that occurred under British rule in Ireland did not occur in the 10 years or so after the annexation of Korea. The imperial government of Japan is making sincere efforts to promote the peace and happiness of Korea. The purpose of the annexation 
is to promote coexistence and mutually pros mutual prosperity between Japan and Korea through a pol politics of universal brotherhood, uh, Ishi Dojin. And that's exactly what is happening. And continues, uh, if Japan tried to rule Korea by a policy is similar to British policy towards Ireland, the same result would occur. However, what Japan is doing is not like that. It is fair and just. That is his uh, perception. And he continues about the United States. Uh, Tokinaga also published a report of his trip to Europe and the United States in which he wrote the fact that the United States with more than 100 million ethnic groups has built a great unified nation over the past 200 years gives us an optimistic outlook on the future of the unification of Japan and Korea. And uh, there is no reason why the two peoples who are so close to each other cannot reconcile based on the necessity of coexistence and mutual assistance. On the contrary, it must be thought that reconciliation and assimilation will be much easier. That is uh, perception. Uh, compared to Ushinosuke Ochi's earlier statements about the difficulties of assimilation policy, we can see that he had an extremely optimistic perception of assimilation policy. Tokinaga believed that the colonial policy of the Japanese empire contrasted with the oppressive policy of the British empire, and that he believed that the spirit of reconciliation and assimilation, which was the basis of the colonial policy of the Japanese empire, was legitimate and could be expected to produce positive results. But to Tokinaga, the assimilation and ethnic fusion of Japan and Korea were the basis of the coexistence and co-prosperity and the gospel of eternal peace in the East and seemed to be unrelated to the disasters of ethnic strife that were occurring in the Western countries. Therefore, to him, the independence movement in Korea was a misguided uproar seen as nothing more than a temporary global trend. From his recognition of colonial rule, we can say he believed that colonial rule was no different from domestic rule in Japan. As Japan's international status improves, there appears to be a lack of tension in Japan's sense of colonial rule. And next uh, reception, uh, what did colonial bureaucrats learn from the British Empire? Uh, in considering the role of colonial bureaucrats in Japan's pre-war colonies and spheres of influence, we looked at the careers and activities of three bureaucrats who worked in the three major colonial organizations, the Government General of Taiwan, the Government General of Korea, and the Governor General of Quantum List of Territories. All these bureaucrats were unique individuals, but the roles they played were defined by the broader framework of the Japanese Empire's colonial policy. The three bureaucrats mentioned in this presentation are about 10 years apart in age. Therefore, there was a simple, similar gap in the timing of their activities and during that time, the perception of the Japanese empire's colonial rule also changed. Of the three, Ushinosuke Ochi, the first uh, one, uh, was the first to enter the bureaucrat's world. He received a German style education as a graduate of the German Studies Society School. The reference targets for Japan's colonial rule uh, before the war or were mainly German and Britain. And he played an active role as a colonial bureaucrat who was familiar with German colonial policy. 
Shinpei Goto, who selected him as a right-hand man, wrote down a conversation with former Governor General of Taiwan, Taro Katsura, about Western countries as a reference object for Japan in his translation of the book by Charles Presswood Lucas, a high-ranking British colonial official. In the preface uh, to a historical geography of the British colonies, uh, he writes, um, left one is the original uh, one uh, by uh, Lucas, and right one is the translation by the uh, uh, government uh, general of Taiwan. And in the preface, uh, the officials were inexperienced and had no insights. Uh, this is the uh, the, <clears throat> the Shinpei Goto or evaluates the situation of Japanese bureaucrats. In the present situation, it was an urgent task to enlighten our bureaucrat. And I think that Conrad's colonization theory, theory in the Dictionary of National Studies of German is concise and convenient to know the outline. And in a book entitled A Historical Geography of British Colonies by the uh, British Lucas, we can find numerous traces of the, the settlement of the colonies of immigrants and the British Empire dominates the world of colonization. The preface describes the recognition, uh, of, recognition of which countries should be referred to determine the state of colonial governance. Uh, these were Germany, represented by Johannes Conrad, who had the lineage of national studies, Stadtlehr, and Britain, represented by Lucas. It has been pointed out that the British Empire provides the practical knowledge that Japanese bureaucrats need to learn and is useful for colonial bureaucrats in actual work. Lucas's A Historical Geography of the British Colonies was widely referenced among bureaucrats and the colonial bureaucrats discussed in this study were also surely under its influence. In addition, the work of H.E. Edgerton, who had a similar lineage to Lucas and was a former British colonial bureaucrat who later took imperial history as a professor at Oxford University, was translated by Ryutaro Nagai who studied at Oxford under Edgerton's supervision and was recommended by many influential people. It is as follows. Uh, left one is the Edgerton's uh, book and right one the translation. And first one is uh, Shigenobu Okuma, the former uh, foreign minister. The reason why Britain achieved unparalleled success in colonial history with its solid liberalism was that its policies were well studied to the times. At a time when all the, all the world's great powers are yearning for peace, colonization from the 20th century onwards will undoubtedly proceed based on the principles of liberty and peace. And second one is by Shinpei Goto. Uh, when I looked through this book, I found that it was generally in the same category as Mr. Lucas' uh, historical geography of British colonies, and that it contained many lessons as a resource for those involved in colonial administration. Uh, this book, which has already received high acclaim, is useful and extremely valuable as a material on the colonial issue for Japan, which has just begun its colonial rule. And third one is by the uh, translator. Learning about the history of how the British people, starting from a remote island in the North Sea, succeeded in building a vast empire on both sides of the earth, on which the sun never sets. 
is an important matter uh, that the Japanese who are facing the need for colonial, colonial expansion should study. And furthermore, the work by work by Lord Cromer, former Consul General of Egypt, who oversaw governing Egypt, was translated, highly acclaimed, and used as a reference for Japan's colonial governance of Korea as follows. Uh, the left one is the original book, and the right one is the translation. And uh, it is said, Lord Cromer's colonial policy did not adhere to the principles of the two political parties in his home country, but instead aimed to provide good government for the, the uh, Egyptian people, establishing and maintaining a system suitable for Egyptian people. And the Lord Cromer rejected the Liberal Party's attempt to implement a constitutional government in Egypt, calling it a utop utopian policy. His policy was to rule Egypt until the Egyptians achieved self-government and independence. And uh, 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 that is seen as the Anglo-Saxon gradualism. And uh, I thought that there was much that Lord Cromer's management in Egypt would provide as a reference for Japan's policies in Korea. And his work is filled with great historical lessons in two volumes. Although Korea's position has changed completely, there is no doubt that the Japanese people will gain many insights from reading this book. This is about the uh, Chromat's book. And it is also said uh, that the work of Lord Lloyd, former high commissioner in Egypt, which discussed the administration of Egypt after Lord Cromer, was also heavily referenced by colonial officials. The journalist at that time uh, interviewed a colonial bureaucrat and wrote as follows. The, I, the uh, first of these concerned the talk uh, I had with Tani Masayuki, the counselor to the Japanese embassy in, in Shinkin, in the Shinkin, in uh, today's uh, Chancheng. Uh, the, uh, the capital of Manchukuo, uh, <clears throat> whom I had known well when he was in Tokyo and who was later to become foreign minister, referring to Lord Lloyd's Egypt since Chroma as a Bible, he spoke enthusiastically of it as a guide for himself and other Japanese officials engaged in drawing up policy plans for Manchukuo by noting where British policy and administration in Egypt had succeeded and where it had failed. It was hoped to avoid the British mistakes and apply to Manchukuo those measures which had brought success. And furthermore, uh, another lesson derived from Lord Cromer's book, he said, was that emphasis on higher education tended to create half-baked students and disgruntled uh, intellectuals. What was required for a backward agrarian people was a sound practical education to assist in raising the standard of agriculture and uh, general physical and moral development of the people. And lastly, the British policy in Iraq was being studied closely with the view to putting Manchukuo family on its feet. Then, with a, a twinkle in his eyes, uh, he added, but we do not propose to urge Manchukuo to enter the League of Nations. That's the uh, Japanese bureaucrat's perception on <clears throat> indigenous people.
lastly, uh, let me, uh, lastly, I would like to summarize the conclusions of today's presentation. Uh, first, uh, there is a, uh, there was a common understanding among Japanese colonial bureaucrats uh, that the ideal way to govern a colony was to conduct it moderately while taking into consideration the unique customs and cultures of the colonies. And second, in terms of colonial rule, the pro prevailing trend was to refer to the colonial governance policies of the British Empire and apply them to the actual governance of colonies and spheres of influence. In doing so, Japan sought to adopt Britain's successes and avoid its failure. A third, a Japan's colonial bureaucrats' perception of governance changed over time as Japan's international position changed. The Japanese colonial bureaucrats' understanding of governance gradually shifted from the way of referring to the German Empire, which centered on the acquisition of knowledge, as seen in Ushinosuke Ochi, the first bureaucrat, to the British Empire, which gradually became an important country for reference. However, Japan became more critical of Britain as time passed based on the uh, Asianism framed by Yoshimura, uh, uh, the second bureaucrat. After passing through a critical reference by Yoshimura, that includes skepticism toward the British Empire and a relative affirmation of a Japanese imperialism, the Tokinaga, the third bureaucrat, led to a negative reference to Western policies, including British colony uh, policy and a complete affirmation of the Japanese Empire's colonial policy. Uh, these changes in the colonial bureaucrats' perception of governance coincided with the rise in the status of the Japanese Empire in the international community, which after World War I uh, came to claim itself to be a first-class country. Initially, it was uh, recognized that the targets of the Japanese Empire's colonial policy were other people with different ways of thinking and customs, and that it was necessary to handle such governance with caution. Uh, however, this recognition gradually weakened and the situation came to be such uh, that only the logic of Japan's domestic governance uh, took priority in the Japanese empire. Uh, this change in the perception of rule is embodied in the three bureaucrats I talked about today. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very in depth and very detailed talk. Let me just um, unshare the screen here. So, this is, it was like a tour of colonial discourse starting from 1900 to the 1920s. Um, and I was wondering, because of the three people that you mentioned, uh, Ouichi passed away in, in 32. Yoshimura was the only one to live, to experience the war and the implications of um, Japanese colonialism and Japanese empire. Um, Tokinaga also passed away quite early. So I wondered whether there was later on in, the, in Yoshimura's life, whether there was a reflection on, on what had happened and whether there is any kind of information available. So that would be one question. And the second question is, I, I, was, I was very struck by the fact that of all the three colonial officers, only Tokinaga had direct experience of the colonial situation both of uh, Ouchi and Yoshimura but, um, experienced Europe, they experienced Britain, they sort of imbibed the, the policy and the, the discourse of empire, liberty, union, and so on and so forth in the capital of empire, but they were not, were they not familiar with conditions actually out there? Because it, it seems that Tokinaga has a very, very different approach precisely because he was familiar with Ireland and, 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 he, and he saw what the issues were on the ground. 
So do you do you think there is there's a big difference, uh, or the, the the difference comes from that um, the fact that they that the, one of them had been exposed to what colonial rule means on the ground, while the other two had more sort of an appreciation of the ideology that comes with it. Mm. Yes. And uh, after that, sorry. <laughs> Do we have any documents uh, of his later life where where he maybe changed um, his evaluation of colonial policy? Because he experienced, he's the only one who experienced the war, uh, who experienced the uh, perhaps the fall of empire um, at the end, or at least lived through a time where this became increasingly um, possible. The second one is the... The second one is more uh, about the direct experience of the colonial situation, uh, because mm -hmm. Tokinaga was in Ireland, as you said, yeah. um, while both Yoshimura and Ochi had never... Had they, had they ever been to India, for example? Um, or to other parts of the British Empire, where they saw how mm. the rule works on the ground, so to speak. Sorry, very complicated. Okay. <laughs> the first one, uh, Yoshimura, not Yoshimura. Um, yeah, mm, yeah, Yoshimura is probably the the only person who, who saw the what. Uh, happened to the British Empire uh, before the World War II. Um, the materials of um, later, as uh, Yoshimura died um, in 1945, so uh, before, just before the end of the World War II. So uh, uh, the today three bureaucrats all, all were dead before the war, but uh, <clears throat> Uh, in general, I mean, about Yoshimura, uh, regarding Yoshimura, uh, Yoshimura uh, adored the British Empire uh, anyway, but uh, he also saw the limitation of the empire. The what is that uh, Yoshimura think the, the uh, dominions are okay? That's the idea listed. But uh, when British people, Afghanistan uh, government, govern, uh, try to govern the uh, other ethnic groups. Uh, they failed. They uh, Yoshimura evaluated, right. and uh, uh, of course, uh, Japanese uh, should avoid that way. And uh, uh, but uh, I'm not quite sure uh, that uh, looking at the uh, materials, I, I can collect. And I show to you today uh, shows the <clears throat> uh, Yoshimura pointed out the British failure, but uh, uh, he also uh, in mind uh, evaluated the Japanese uh, Empire also failed as well, and uh, the idealistic uh, situation never uh, come come uh, for him, I believe. And the second one that's very uh, difficult, but uh, uh, I think uh, three of the bureaucrats uh, uh, experienced the same, I mean, uh, experience in uh, uh, when they dispatched to abroad. Right. And uh, uh, felt that basically the same thing, uh, uh, the best way to rule the people is that uh, uh, I mean, uh, show respect to the people there. And uh, I think that the principle of um, <clears throat> they, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, so, what <laughs> can I say? Um, um, so, I, I wanted to uh, show the transition of the Japanese uh, colonial bureaucracy perception. First, uh, 
very uh, naive and uh, very eager to learn from the West, uh, like a student first. Mm -hmm. And second, Yoshimura, uh, uh, I mean, Oji in Germany uh, learned about the German's rule about Poland. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was very uh, talented and uh, learned a lot. And second one, Yoshimura, uh, Landrot, and he's also the talented uh, bureaucrat. Uh, but he, uh, as time passed, the Japan status uh, went up in the uh, international community, and they became confident in some way. And but th about Yoshimura, uh, mm -hmm. they still wanted to learn uh, the ideal. The situation, uh, ideal policies from the West. Uh, that was uh, uh, from Germany to become Britain. But uh, he found the limitation as well. But very, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, uh, still uh, not so confident. Uh, uh, still, I mean, learn. And uh, uh, take this, don't take this, uh, mm -hmm. like that. The last one, uh, the Tokinaga, uh, that's completely different. They became somewhat uh, very confident uh, uh, after the World War I. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, uh, already uh, Anglo Japanese alliance is gone. So uh, uh, then the bureaucrats uh, became not to care the British. Uh, uh, government colonial policy. I mean, uh, not so good, <laughs> they began to think. And uh, they created the Asianism. And uh, it's a very broad uh, concept. And uh, I personally think that the Asianism is the uh, 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 not original one, uh, that uh, things learned by Western countries and uh, named it Asianism. That's my uh, right. idea. But uh, Asadwa is different and uh, uh, misunderstanding the value of uh, the importance to learn from Western country. And uh, that leads to the, led to the tragedy of Japanese empire. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Whether Thank you. Can... <laughs> Thank you. <very> <laughs> Thank you for your uh, that response. Yes, uh, questions. Uh, let's start with the uh, big center. Thank you so much for Thank very um, detailed and exciting stories about those bureaucrats. Uh, Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I'm going to ask one. <laughs> um, so these are the perceptions, right? Yeah. So how? So to what extent these perceptions actually influence the colonial policies? How mm -hmm. you know? How did it that did it directly influence colonial policies? Because the perceptions and actual policies are not necessarily the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Very, very essential uh, <coughs> questions. And uh, actually, uh, the perception, uh, uh, well, perception is perception, and the actual policy is actual policy, and. Uh, the, that's a very difficult, but the, uh, I checked several reports uh, uh, being used for the uh, policy making. And uh, in that, uh, the policy makers sometimes refer to the reports made by them. Uh, for example, uh, Yoshimura uh, often, often uh, referred in his report. And this is very good for the, uh, or make the, making the uh, policy, colonial policy, I think. But this is very a small, I mean, fact uh, I can find in the report, report, report. Uh, so uh, maybe very weak to insist that, the, uh, that they influenced a lot to the actual policies. But uh, at the moment, I need to collect them as much as possible, as many as possible, uh, like that. And uh, uh, Tokina as, as well, I mean. So 
And uh, there is a uh, articles in the uh, newspapers that uh, uh, there is a meeting about uh, policy making, and uh, the lecturer is there, uh, Yoshimura or something like that, Ouchi. So uh, they say something uh, uh, based on their uh, experience, and uh, it uh, delivered to the colleagues, uh, younger bureaucrats. And I believe there was some kind of influence and uh, it uh, should be reflected to the actual process. But you, you are right, I need more, I mean, research. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Thank you very much. No, 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 no. that is a uh, good question. Thank you, here and then over there, yes. Mm -hmm. so, so my question is more towards like modern times. So mm -hmm. I wanted to ask about your perspective on the notion that the Japanese government hasn't apologized sufficiently and sincerely for its colonial straw. Mm -hmm. Um so for example, the last year in May 2023, the Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida was to exactly apologize in the way that's um, mm -hmm. like the domestic public opinion, mm -hmm. which may come across as disingenuous. Uh, and that also coincided with surveys carried out in South Korea. Whereby 24% believe Japan never apologized, but 58% mm -hmm. believe Japan apologized inadequately, especially pertaining to the subject of the young or comfort women who some are uh, still likely to stay and suffer from the traumatic past. Mm -hmm. um, do you believe that if Japanese apologized in a more appropriate by the perception of the South Koreans, that it would then alleviate and also improve the relations between the two countries? Oh, yeah, yes, I, I think so. I mean, uh, the two apologize more, it is essential. And uh, uh, it is necessary to establish, I mean, uh, that collect the, the facts. And uh, uh, and you, you may be, uh, uh, feel strange when, why uh, uh, the persons who are not uh, uh, think badly about the uh, past. Uh, uh, I think they uh, uh, they didn't know. And uh, this, uh, for example, the uh, Tokinaga, the last one, he is very positive. I mean, optimist, too optimistic. That is a, a problematic perception, I think. And uh, some of uh, the uh, recent people, uh, I mean, uh, had the same kind of perception, but uh, that is a perception, and they really believe in that perception. That's the problem. So uh, I uh, show the perception is like this. How do you think? How I think? And. Uh, uh, criticize it properly. That is a long way to go, but uh, I need to uh, do for us Japanese. And uh, but uh, as you may think uh, now, uh, the situation of Japanese, I mean, situation is is not good. I think. I mean, they need to learn the past of Japanese in the uh, behavior, but. Uh, uh, as I showed uh, in today's presentation, the perception, uh, I mean, weakened, I mean, late uh, in the past, more Japanese, I mean, uh, feel sorry for that the behavior in the past. But nowadays, it's weakened. That's a problem. So how can we do and that's that also my problem. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right here and then here. Thanks for that. Um, comparison between the, the point that the society made about the, when the, uh, the bureaucrats did investigate, did they restrict their own questions to the rich bureaucrats or they went to see it from the rule, the people who were being ruled by Britain? And I cannot help but compare also perception by me that um, uh, uh, speaking to many Japanese friends also for seminars, that there is a perception that in Korea and Taiwan, there was no a movement for national liberation from Japan between the two wars, not the critical one. Compared to Egypt, 
as you mentioned, Lord the Cromer, mm. there was opposition to his uh, reforms, and uh, also there was a 1919 revolt and uh, in Egypt and 1936 uh, treaty with Britain. In other words, there was a nucleus of a national movement to uh, uh, renegotiate the relationship with Britain, not to say independence, but I think to have a more favor to the locals in this case. Did you see it in the uh, bureaucrats that you've seen? They were aware of it, or only how to rule uh, the uh, Brit uh, the Japanese dominions in a successful way, like Britain did? Hmm. Oh. One more time. Sorry, I I couldn't catch you. Can you reformulate the question or make it? Uh, a bit shorter, maybe, or frustrating. Sorry, <laughs> my uh, ability to the Japanese rule, learning from the bureaucrats, mm. the three and others mm. were successful in Korea and Taiwan, and uh, because there was no eruption or a, a breakage from national movements to uh, get away from Japan. Uh, the last point, because there is a perception in Taiwan. Till now, there is a favorable outlook for, to the Japanese legacy. Mm. There is no hostility as compared to Korea. Mm. Uh -huh. That's a difficult. difficult. Mm. 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 Um, okay. Um, um, look, I mean, researching on the bureaucrats, um, <clears throat> uh, we can find the differences between the each colonies, and uh, one reason, uh, I mean, there are different situations there, and some are very uh, hostile to Japanese rule. Uh, some part not so hostile. And the, why is that? That's a problem. And uh, I, <clears throat> uh, as far as I, I, I learned, the, the, the place or colonies, uh, which was, uh, that was a country or something like that, is they have a very high pride and uh, resist very fiercely against the Japanese rule. But uh, for example, tai Taiwan is a part of China. And uh, uh, I mean, it's very difficult to say, but uh, at the time, uh, uh, not a country, so uh, some kind of regions. So uh, it's considered to be a uh, weak uh, protest there. But uh, at the at the first uh, when Japan began to uh, rule the Taiwan, uh, as you may say, uh, there was a fierce protest there. So uh, uh, it's very difficult to uh, evaluate the uh, strongness of the uh, uh, protest uh, each in each areas. Uh, so I need to. Uh, check more. I mean, la moi. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think you are. Uh, you pointed out the very important things. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's also safe to say that if you learn about um, the success of the Egyptian mm -hmm. case from an autobiography by Lord Cromer himself, mm -hmm. that there will be very little about the the shortcomings, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Um, thank you, Professor, for the great talk. Yeah. Um, so we were talking about the, uh, the perceptions of the bureaucrats on the uh, British colonial role or philosophy, but you have also mentioned the uh, general role of Poland and also the United States and the British in Egypt. But I'm very kind of, I am wondering about whether they have any perceptions towards the French imperial style because it's somehow different from the in, uh, from the uh, British one, the French were very interested in creating French citizens out of the uh, indigenous colonies. They wanted to create a French Algeria, for example. Yeah, 
Uh, they express the local cultures. I'm interested in knowing whether they do have any kinds of perceptions or kind of criticism maybe. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for your question. Um, um, when Japanese uh, uh, try to learn from what country, uh, you are uh, the problems you pointed out uh, uh, occurred. And uh, about French, it is said uh, when Japan tried to, uh, when Japan first acquired, uh, got uh, Taiwan as the colony, first colony, uh, they had no method. So they tried French way first. And uh, it is said that failed because the uh, French, as you you said, uh, um, I mean, assimilation is very uh, st uh, strong rather than British case. So uh, uh, it doesn't work, uh, Japanese uh, colonial view of thought. And then the next, where should we learn from? And then they uh, chose the British way. So uh, uh, the way of colonizing people uh, different from the, uh, each, uh, each uh, country's uh, British way, German way, and French way. And uh, in uh, about Japanese case, French case, uh, not so seen as important. And then the German way or British way. And uh, first, uh, they were equal, uh, evaluated equally. But uh, as the uh, German uh, lost the war, first of all, won, uh, they abandoned the German way and showed British way. So, I mean, there are diff different evaluation about different countries' colonization policy. Um, that is very important. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no further urgent questions, I think we've reached uh, the end of our talk. Thank you very much, Professor Kato, for a fantastic talk. There will be the opportunity to ask further questions. Do join us in the uh, senior common room. If you don't know how to go there, latch on to somebody who does know and do come back next week uh, when our very own Dr. Monica Hinkel uh, will speak about her curatorial work for the Dulwich Picture Gallery, where she's in the process of putting on an exhibition called Yoshida, Three Generations of Japanese Printmaking, opening on the 19th of June later this year. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.